<laughs> it's ridiculous. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I know. It's scarier where you are. <laughs> is is this thing on? Yeah. Okay. okay. All right. It's on green. All right. Are we live? Wonderful. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for coming out this evening. If you heard me talking about the duck work, you can be glad you're probably watching this at home <laughs> and not in the line of fire. So it's such a pleasure to have Robert Tagoni back. Bob and I have been together over his entire career, so it's so much fun to. Uh, Twenty-five years. I think. It has been at least that long. Yeah. I just, I just learned. I'm finishing. Um, I'm, I'm editing two historicals. There's a story behind each of them, but um, they'll be, I think, my 30th when they wow. come out. 29th and 30th books when they come out. Yeah. And I can remember when I wrote Sinai Canary and I opened it up and there was nothing on the inside page, you know, previously. <laughs> right. Zero. Well, I stand corrected. We were not together for Sinai Canary. It was, in fact, the David Sloan. So Bob wrote legal thrillers. And he's written three spy stories, which I truly love, in which the situation in Russia probably precludes your writing a fourth. No. Um, no. They are really wonderful books. So you can see on the inside of the book, there's a listing of his books, and there's a listing by um, the, the lead character, so you can, you can work it out. And then he's written, what, now seven standalones? I think it's something like that. Something like that. Sam yeah. Hell and um, other books. So he's a very versatile writer. But Tracy Crosswhite is the book where the, the character that moved him to his present publisher and turned him into a bestseller. And this is number 10 in the Tracy Crosswhite series. So, And it's not the last. <laughs> I've gotten so many emails from people well, saying, oh, this is the last. One last kill. Mm -hmm. I'm like, is this the last book? And I'm like, no. It's not the last book. It'll keep going. Well, you have to be. I mean, John Sanford has always said to me, when you see Final Prey, he said, when it's called Final Prey, it will be. So, uh, there. see, that was it. Okay. Clunk, right. Um, so, yeah, I think using a word and a title can be a little disconcerting to your readers. But what's more interesting in a way is that this is the third book in kind of an interior yeah. trilogy that started when Tracy came back to Seattle and got moved into the cold case thing. Right. So why don't you start with book eight and kind of carry us forward? Yeah, it actually started with a short story, um, which uh, which I wrote, and it was called The, La the uh, Last Stand. No. Uh, Last Stand? No. It was uh, the, La the Last Line. <laughs> Uh-oh. Um, I'll tell you what, I'll look it up while you're talking. But... Um, what was interesting was I, I was in the process of writing um, what she found, and uh, Amazon came to me and said, "Would you be willing to do an Amazon short?" And I said, "Sure." And they, you know, said, "Give us some ideas." And I thought, "Well, what if I wrote a short that would be a prequel to what she found?" And they thought that's a great idea, so I did. And my readers loved the book, but <laughs> hated the fact that they said there's no ending. And um, you know, I had to think about that for a while because it says right on the book a short story, um, but they they didn't th that that wasn't good enough. They they weren't happy about it. But um, the last line. It is the last line. Yeah. Just, okay. And then you have two after that listed: the Academy and Third Watch. That's the uh, two short stories. Yeah. The Acad but the Academy, I guess, and Third Watch had beginning, middles, and end. I felt like the last line had a beginning and a middle and an end. But I'm starting to realize that people don't, they don't like it when the bad guys are alive at the end of the book. <laughs> it's like they, they want something to happen. But I've learned through my own reading and all, that when you have a good antagonist, you don't kill them. <laughs> because you kill them, they're gone. But if you keep them going, like Johnny Nolasco, you know, or now the, the new police chief, um, it, the, the readers... They, they, you know, they get, they hate them, but they get into it because they know what the, that world is. So I, anyway, I wrote the last line, and basically, it's a story of um, when Del Castigliano is a is a brand newbie to the department, and he comes in, and uh, there's a, bodies are found in Lake Union. True story. That's mm -hmm. a that's a real story, and the police go down there, and they can't figure out what happened to these guys, how they died. Um, and a reporter is involved, and that leads into what she found. There's an investigative reporter. She's a little bit nuts, uh, kind of a different b bird. 
Um, but she's got these files and they're, they're investigative files and they, they contain some explosive information and that people don't want to get out. And so that was, um, that, that led into that story. And then that story leads into one last kill. And I think I'm kind of done with that trilogy. Um, well, yeah. I mean, there's a pretty definitive result yeah. at the end of it. So yeah. um, you could branch out in a, in a new direction. And the truth is that, you know, people having careers in the police department, they move around. You know, I mean, all of us, everybody started washing Bosch again, you know, because Michael made a decision. Michael will be here November 9th, by the way, and we're going to be off site at a church up the road, which will be a, an interesting venue yeah. to try out, right? Um, but anyway, you know, he aged Harry in real time, and so Harry is now too old to be in the Los Angeles Police Department, and so they're having to... Ian Rankin did the same thing with Rebus. He made him too old to stick around in the Edinburgh Constabulary, and actually now it's called Police Scotland, I think. It's had okay. various name changes. Well, and they, that's, one of the, that's one of the challenges you have when you write in a series. Um, do you write... James Bond or Jack Reacher, which is they're the same age in every book. They start in the same place every time. And they, you know, Jack Reacher goes into a town and there's a woman in there and there's a problem in there and he's got to deal with the problem and he's got the woman and then he moves to the next town. Um, and I'm not, I'm not belittling the, the books at all. I mean, Lee is a fantastic writer and he does a great job and obviously now from his success now, just just a moment and now it's, it's andrew because andrew. we did the book launch for it on monday and it was the official end of lee and begin beginning of andrew has signed a four book contract to write four reachers now which will take it to 32 reachers wow and even even a series like that can if it could come to an end yeah you know and i think as an author you owe it to your readers if they really love a long-term character try not to die before they do but um but if it's really you know readers are so distressed you know when i mean over there i've been doing this for 34 years and a lot of authors that i love have either stopped writing or sadly died and you know all of you go oh it's really too bad about it. and they say but what about the character and that's why there is such a big thing going on with legacy writers yeah. you know that readers don't want to let go of a favorite author and so if the uh, if the author's estate allows it, um, other people can come in and write it. For example, Stuart Woods died, was it two years ago, I think? Yeah. And uh, now a really nice, very good author whom I much have admired over the years, Brett Battles, um, has started writing Stuart Woods. He was self, self, he was self-publishing for a while only because he wanted to write a book a month and nobody would let him. He wasn't James Patterson quite yet. Um, and so... He, he went off on his own. Yeah. It wasn't because he wasn't good. It was because yeah, he no, wanted to write good. a lot more books yeah, than I agree. traditional publishing, you know, would yeah. allow him to do. But so for the Stuart Woods fans, this is good news, right? Because they'll get to carry on with Stone Barrington buying houses, fast cars, seducing women. And <laughs> it's a male wet dream to be Stuart. It really is. For <laughs> anyway, we digress. But what I'm saying to you is that I hope that whatever you do with Tracy, you will end her in a good place when you yeah, decide no, I, you've I will, had enough. I will. I will definitely. I will definitely keep Tracy. I. I age Tracy slowly, usually by season. That's winter. Now it's summer. Now it's spring. Um, but you know the challenge is people go, okay. You know, she can't be nearly going to die in every single book. And so, you know, one of the one of the tricks, and and I was a little worried. I was like, does this does this book have enough action in it, you know, to to make it a thriller? Um, but I can't have her nearly die in every single book because then by the tenth book, you're like, okay, well, I know she's going to live. So I mean, what am I getting all worked up about? Um, but I have a great idea for number eleven. I have a great idea. I'm so excited about this idea. I can't get to it because I'm in the process of writing the two historicals, but I have a, she's going to go back to her roots. She's going to go back to the shooting. And it's, I think it's going to be, I'm really excited to do it. Okay, but you've given yourself an interesting problem in that she is now a mother and she has a child. So whether Tracy ages gracefully the is kid's the, got to age the kid is yeah. probably going to age faster than her mother yeah it was really what it comes down to because it won't be reasonable for her to stay a baby yeah um so you know let's face it as readers we all have to sort of accept the fact that time is flu you know 
is different in books than well, in real and, life. You know, we all know kids change you, right? You you, you definitely change with kids, right? You you you're when your kids are babies, you're one, and then when your kids get a little older, and then when they get to high school, if you have a psychopathic father, you're working them to think they're going to get a scholarship in football. I didn't do that, but um, you know, uh, yeah, but, but you're you know, one you have of all those what, like eleven. I'm one of ten. Ten. Right. So I'm sure that there were variations in your family about, you know, how you all turned out. We are we are so different. I mean, we are we are so different. Um, You know, there's that whole thing about nature versus nurture. And because of my own experiences with my brothers and sisters, um, I think it's nature. I I mean, we are we are a hundred and some my my couple of my brothers and I are 180 degrees. We're just, we're just not, not the same people. Now, my, my mother and father did a great job on us. None of us has ever been in trouble. We've never been in prison. We don't have any addictions, anything like that. But, um, but we're, we're different, you know, we're, we're different. So, um, I, I'm, I really believe that, um, you know, how you're raised and who you're raised by is it, what is influences you. So it'd be interesting. It's going to be interesting to see how Daniela turns out, um, having a, a police officer mom and a and a lawyer father. Is she going to be an only child? You don't know I yet. I don't know yet. <laughs> I don't know yet. Right. Um, and also, you know, if you have two working parents with demanding professions and they have a child, that can introduce all sorts of tension in terms of, you know, who's home who's home with the child. And, and an additional question, and this, this came up a lot in the 90s when the whole women's sleuth thing went on and women were taking risks. If you're a mom of a young child, can you really afford to put yourself, can you morally even put yourself at risk so that the child might be deprived of a mom? Well, and I think that's one of the things that, that Tracy struggles with because, um, yeah, she's a mom, but she also has a very strong sense of justice because of what happened to her sister. And so she has this this desire to help women in need. And that's the idea for the 11th book is, you know, she's got this opportunity, she thinks, to basically either solve three unsolved murders or to actually find the women still alive. And, um, you know, does she take that risk? Does she take that 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 shot? Um, so you have to work it in a way that it's almost like it may not necessarily be um, something she thinks about, but she happens to just stumble into it. Um, there's a lot of different ways to do it. I mean, the biggest, I think the biggest problem with, with, for thriller writers is the cell phone. I mean, you can get reception anywhere now, go. you know? So it's like, you know, everybody, everybody, if you're writing a scene, everyone thinking, well, why didn't you just call somebody? <laughs> you know, why just call the police? You know, um, you have to, you know, and there's only so many times you can go, or cell phone died or, you know, it fell in the water and, um, but it's, it's a real, it's a real problem. One of the, one of the fun things about going back to Seattle in 1933 I didn't have cell phones. I didn't have computers. I didn't have instant information. You know, everything took a while to get there. Mm -hmm. And I remember those days because I remember practicing law when I started in the 80s. And you wrote letters to opposing attorneys. So you wrote a stink letter to the other attorney. You know, you suck and here's why. Mm -hmm. And then you had a three-day reprieve before you got a letter back saying, no, you suck and here's why. (laughs) Now it was instantaneous. You suck. No, you suck. No, you suck. (laughs) You suck. And they bury you in paperwork. Besides, remember computers are supposed to free us from paper? And boy, is it the other way around, especially the legal profession. But it, it, you know, for for a writer and, and, you know, I'm, I freely admit I'm, I'm probably a little OCD and I have low levels of anxiety. And so I am constantly working. Um, and you know, like I said, and I I don't know, since 2012 at something like 20, 20, 20 books, something like that. Yeah. But, um, I, I love what I'm doing. I, and I, I love doing it. Um, but there's going to come a point in time um, that I'm going to have to think hard about, do I want to be writing that many books? I mean, I think I'm putting out a book like every nine months. Yeah, but that's really on you. I mean, it's not like your it publisher. Is. And see, I forever will, will, I will forever see Bob sitting next to me in my library at home talking about quitting. I mean, that, you know, that was, I mean, we had a very long morning together 
Um, and, you know, it's so fascinating for me to see you now from that moment, you know, which, yeah. I'll, which yeah. I just can't forget. Barbara and I plotted my sister's grave. We did. Just to get him interested. And you that's, know, the, again, that's the best selling book I've ever mm -hmm. had. I think we just went over three million. Marvelous. Yeah. yeah. Well, Bob has a big international audience. Um, his, um, his publisher, his, you know, translation rights are sold and all the rest of it. So the American audience is maybe still the biggest for it crime is. fiction, yeah. but you know, they're, they're huge. Um, and now that translation is so much easier than, um, there are many more foreign language editions today than there used to be because paying a translator is really expensive. But, you know, this is where AI might actually come in and be of some decent use. England's, England's huge. Um, Germany's huge. Germany sells They have really an enormous well. appetite for crime fiction, Re don't really, they? Really, yeah. And, and so the Japan. the better. Yeah, and Japan is huge. Especially we have actually Jap Japanese customers. You know, we ship every day. Um, we had an author here last night who's Canadian, and he didn't realize that it's... It just drives me crazy, but it costs $22.23 to send a book to Canada because they have yeah. a tariff, whereas we charge 8 and... You know, the post office picks up the rest and sends it there. So yeah. um, if it's a foreign language edition, then, you know, it would it would be easier. There are barriers to yeah. moving books around. Well, I used to, I, I get copies of my novel. So like if, when this book came out, they send me, you know, 50, right. co I think 50 copies for me to give out to people to kind of try to get the buzz going. But they were sending me like 50 copies of Hungarian and 50 copies of, right. of you know, uh, Spanish, which was okay. But, I mean, try to give away 50 copies of Hungarian and 50 copies of Chinese. I mean, I don't know that many people that speak those no. languages. We actually have foreign language. You know, Diana sent, we, we sell foreign language Outlander editions. And Steve Berry sends us these foreign language editions. So, yeah. because we have this big international audience, so we can actually sell you know, well, Steve, I, I, Stephen I should, Hungarian. I should send them to you. I knew you were going to say that. I probably shouldn't have brought it up. Right. So um, police procedurals have to proceed in, in a linear way to a great degree. I mean, you've gone back in time in this one. But, you know, the, the whole fashion for novels with twists and so forth today that's so big, they don't have to proceed in a straightforward manner. But if you're a cop working a case, it has to start with something yeah. and you move through the investigation. So if you're writing a Seattle-based police procedural, it's pretty hard not to have the Green River Killer surface from time to time that's because that's the really big Seattle case. Seattle and that's had part had a, of your inspiration for this book. Yeah, I mean, Seattle has had a, a lot of serial killers. And I uh, was able to ask a homicide detective one time why. And do you know what his answer was? Because there's so many ways to get rid of bodies. You have mountains, you have rivers, you have lakes, you have ponds, you have, you know, the ocean. You, I mean, you, you name it. Um, there are so, so many, and it's, it's, it's eerie. It's scary. I mean, it's, it's, it's hard now for serial killers to, to, to do what they've done for years because there's, the police have gotten so good at DNA and all this other kind of stuff to, to catch them. But I mean, when you think about it, it's just, it's. And if you have a, a young daughter like I do, it's frightening. It's really frightening. So why don't you tell us about this this case? Because here's, here's Tracy. Well, part of the problem is she and the police chief are at odds because Tracy can expose the police chief as having been on the take for a drug gang, right? Right. Right. Um, and there's, you know, there's problems in that. So she, she doesn't really have any, any solid evidence to do it, but she knows it's, it's true. And, um, so in, in what she found, she's, she meets this young woman who comes in and says, can you find my mother? She disappeared 30 years ago and we never heard what happened to her. And she was an investigative reporter for the Seattle Post Intelligencer. And I, I have her files and she was working on these explosive cases. And I think one of these things is related. So that was called what she found where Tracy has to go and, and try to find the mother. Um, in, in this book, what happens is the police chief comes into Tracy and says, um, yeah, I want you to solve a serial killing, a serial killer. I want you to catch a serial killer who we tried to catch years ago and never caught him. 
and it's a it's a hopeless case then that's why she's given it to tracy is is she's hoping tracy will fail and um there's was i think uh 13 murders of of women um but there was a a, a a difference the first eight or nine were prostitutes and then after that were sort of housewives suburban women and they thought it was two different people they were trying to figure out what the connection was and in any event the the story is familiar to tracy because it's one of the files that this woman has so tracy says you know okay but i cannot i cannot solve this without knowing what the the task force did back in the day when they were trying to catch this this killer and vic fazio worked on that task force so what tracy is basically saying without saying it is let me work with vic and um weber the police chief she says okay fine i'll i'll get somebody for you to work with and she gives her the who was the per man who was the head of the task force Johnny Nolasco. So now Tracy's got to work with her biggest enemy in order to catch in order to catch this killer. Right. So, but the police chief is reacting to the fact that the the newspaper is going to revisit. Oh yeah. It's like a what is it? Twenty five years. Twenty five years. Twi right. And they're going to run a whole like twenty five anniversary um, look piece at why the serial, why the cops didn't catch the serial killer, basically. So the police chief wants to duck that, but she's also hoping to get Tracy. Right. right. So at some point, you're going to have to deal with the police chief and Tracy. I mean, I don't know if this warfare can go on forever. It can. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. Uh, what I, again, um, and I, uh, you know, I keep I keep blanking on the name of the TV show. Um, it was a British TV show. It was about Alfred Batman's butler when he was a young man, and he um, he worked in in um, British intelligence. And there there was a series that, and that's where I started to see they never killed the bad guys. And there wasn't just one antagonist. There was multiple antagonists so what i what i'm hoping to do um is that you have you'll have nolasco you'll have weber and then you'll have whatever the whatever the case is you'll have that bad guy but you know it just it allows it allows for what stephen king talks about which is tension on every page um and you know you read some of his books and and if you read them closely you realize there's tension on every page it's not the same tension it, it might be psychological tension you know it might be um employ her work uh um tension you know with her her work colleagues and then it might be you know physical tension where she's at, in danger so um so yeah i'm just sort of just keep toying with this idea of um having multiple you know, multiple people that are she doesn't she doesn't get along with. Well, that's fine, but I mean, there's a difference between the actual bad guys, like the serial mm -hmm. killer, and the jerks in the department. Right. So, what you're you're not necessarily letting the the serious bad actor go. You're talking about keeping the and I I think almost all police procedurals that I've ever read, there's always some sort of interdepartmental politics and rivalry and yeah. stuff. I mean, again, coming back to Harry Bosch, it was always that way. You know, he and the and the head of the LAPD were forever, you know, even in the television, they were always at, you know, yeah. cutthroat points. And I used to have two homicide detectives that that wor worked with me on each of my books, and um, one of them tragically passed away, 48 years of age, um, not in the line of duty. Um, and then his his girlfriend, who is Tracy Crosswhite, um, you know, just it was too much. Uh, she worked for a while, and then she just pulled out and. She's now retired. She still reads my books. She still helps me with them. But, um, you know, things are changing in the police department rapidly. Um, the technology that they're using is, 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 so part of the challenge for writing these is just staying on top of what's going on and what's happening. And then also, what will they tell you? Like, you know, for the longest time, they wouldn't tell me that they're able to track cell phones without the towers or anything, they have the ability to track your cell phone. Um, they have the ability to do a lot of things. But, um, you know, you just kind of keep meeting people. 
Um, I started golfing with a gentleman who's had Parkinson's for 17 years. Uh, he's a, he's a Dan, Dr. Dan. He's, he's a marvel, you know, 18 years and he still goes out and golfs. He's 78. And so we'll go out and we'll golf with Dan and, and Dan is like, uh, the mayor. I mean, he knows everybody. So he invited me to go to the Bellevue police auction and I went. And the first thing he did was, it was introduce me to the guys in the crime lab. And they said, anything we can do to help you. You know, so you just kind of keep. Well, you have an update on, we won't talk about what it is, but you have a DNA update in this book. Yes. Which I thought was really very cool. Yeah. Yeah. And they're, I mean, it, it's, it's amazing what they're able, they're able to do now. It really is. I mean, you know, when you put your spit in that little bottle, <laughs> there's a lot more consequences than you think on what they can do with that spit. Wasn't I reading about, was it the Green River? I think it might be in your book, actually. The Green River Killer, they could never get enough evidence to get a warrant to get a DNA sample. But then one day he made the mistake of flipping a piece of chewing gum he'd been chewing into the trash. Yeah. And once it's out there in a public space, the police were able to grab the chewing gum. Yeah, they took a, they took a pencil and they yes. brought it in. They got it tested. And once they got the results, then they went to Dave Riker's office at the time he was the sheriff. And they said, we got a positive on the DNA. Who do you think it is? And he said, it's Ridgeway. And they said, yeah. The, the guys who worked with Ridgeway at a paint, car paint shop, I used to call him Green River Gary because they thought he was the killer. Yeah. And he probably loved that because they are basically narcissists and you know oh, very I, much yeah and so he's probably thought that was really a sort of a great joke that they would call him that well uh, so but they couldn't actually prove it one of my wife's best friends growing up was the paralegal who had to work in the office what they did is they took an office building they took an entire floor and they turned it into a prison and they had gary in in one of the rooms and they kept him in there because they were, he was feeding them information on where all the bodies were. And she, at one point, took a selfie like this because Ridgeway was standing right behind her. Um, and so she had all these stories about what a narcissist he was and all the things that he would do. And even after when he finally was you know, convicted, he pled guilty, and he went to prison, he used to call them up and he'd say, you know, I, I remember another body. I think I remember another body. And they'd say, okay. And, and he'd say, yeah, I can. I, he was just trying to get out of prison. He was just trying to get out outside. They have a day out, sort of a like a out. picnic. They'd, they'd you know, take him out, t show us where the body is. And, oh, you know what? I guess I was wrong. So they started to catch up on him, what he was doing. So even even caught, these these guys are, you know, they're, they're, they're always, always thinking, of, you know, trying to think. One, and they're usually incredibly bright. You know, a lot of the times they're very bright. But someone just asked me this question on uh, social media the other day. Um, I started the book, um, uh, the second book in, in the Tracy Crossway series where she's hunting a serial killer. I started with a quote um, from a criminal uh, psycho psychiatrist. And she's told me, she said, for, for, uh, for psychopaths, there is no treatment, there is no cure, there's only prison. I mean, you're never going to cure these people. They're just never going to, they're never going to solve it. And I thought that was just chilling. Very much so. Yeah. so what, what makes you decide to move from one sort of fiction to another? I mean, why did you write the first Charles Jenkins spy story, for example? Um, you know, I, I think it's, I think a lot of it is, um, I just like to challenge myself, you know, um, when I first wrote The Extraordinary Life of Sam Hell, nobody really wanted to take a look at it because I was a crime writer. You know, even my agent was reluctant initially. Um, and, you know, I just, I'm, I, I guess I'm kind of one of those people that if somebody says you can't do that, I say, really? Let's see. Um, and I, I know, I, I, I am a big fan of Stephen King. Um, I, not so much the horror because I'm also a big chicken and there's no way I'm reading his horror and then going to bed at night. That's just not going to happen. Uh, but you know, um, the green mile and 11, 22, 63 and Mr. Mercedes and you know, all, all the, and you know, I always thought 
you know, he writes, he kind of writes what he wants and he can, he can transcend it. And I've never considered myself a genre fiction writer. I've just considered myself a writer. You know, I've written, I've written journalism. I've written short stories. I've written poems. I mean, um, I just, I like to write and, um, I, I gotta be careful how I, how I say this, but, um, you know, there's still some people out there that, that question it. And I always, I think, you know, when I'm getting these questions, I'm thinking to myself, did you read Sam Hell? Did you read the world play chess? You know, um, but it's, it's, you know, it's sort of a stigma that writers have to deal with sometimes. I remember Lee Childs one time at Thriller Fest, I think he had written like 18 Jack Reachers. And I don't know if Lee's ever written anything else. I, I don't know. But I remember he was just like, oh my God, you know, I'm going to kill Jack Reacher. <laughs> Obviously he didn't. But I remember him saying that at a Thriller Fest. Well, you know, let's go back to Conan Doyle. He got so tired of Sherlock Holmes, he did kill him. He never sent him over Reichenbach Falls. And then there was such an enormous reaction to him. He had to... He eventually brought him back, but that's those missing years where all the people who write Sherlock Holmes, you know, or want to write Sherlock Holmes, they always do it in that those missing Sherlock Holmes, the missing years, you yeah, know, yeah. he may have been in Tibet. He could have been in Minnesota. I mean, you know, yeah. the variations are endless. Well, and it, it, what's funny is it's not just readers that, that want to see your characters <clears throat> live. It's, it's editors. Yes. I mean, I'm working on a book right now and uh, it's 1947, you know, World War II story that really has never been told. And there's a sub in, in a portion of the book and, you know, the sub's going down and, and the, the hole will breach at 750 meters. The hole will breach. And, you know, the guy who's in charge of telling them how far they're going down, he's saying, you know, uh, 720 dialogue, 725 dialogue and it hit 750. And the last line is this guy saying 750 meters breach is eminent. Book goes on, right? Because the story's not over. I got edit saying, well, what happened to the sub? <laughs> right. Nothing good is it all happened. Well, if it will comfort you, um, Ken Follett will always talk about the fact that when he wrote Pillars of the Earth, which is his best-selling book of all time, everyone didn't want him to write it. Nobody wanted to publish it. His, his agent, the whole bit. And now he's just come out with a new book called Armor, where he's, you know, been bringing the story of that village yeah. along. Yeah. Ken Kruger was here in uh, September, and he too uh, went through the same thing when he wrote, um, I'm trying to remember the title, I can't. But anyway, he's now written three books outside of his series. Well, and, the, be the best thing that ever happened to me was, was Gracie Doyle my Amazon editor at Thomas and Mercer because um, she's a brilliant editor and she's very well read. And here I am writing crime novels and I went to Gracie. I said, Gracie, I got, I got this other story and I'd love, I'd love for you to read it. And she said, okay, well, what is it? I said, well, it's really, I think more literary, you know, contemporary fiction. It's called the extraordinary life of Sam Ellis. said, let me read it. And she was really the, the person that then went to Lake Union and she, she said to me, she goes, Bob, this, I love this book, but this is a, this is a Lake Union book. Um, but if it hadn't been for Gracie, you know, probably wouldn't have happened. I love Gracie. Gracie yeah, and I are good friends. And every once in a while she'll say to me, there's Bob living his best life. She says, so she's enabled you to do that. We often talk about yeah. that. You're living your best life. Yeah. I mean, I'm very, I'm really, I'm, I'm so blessed. You know, I was, had this conversation with, a guy the other day, um, you know, my life is not without its small trials and tribulations, but I mean, I, I have great kids. I have an incredible wife and I have an incredible life. I, I'm just, I'm really very blessed and I'm really very grateful. Um, because as Barb knows, I mean, there were many times where things could have gone in different directions and, um, you know, I don't know why they didn't necessarily, but I just know that uh, when, when, in, when that time comes, I'm going to have a, a lot of people to thank when I get up there. <laughs> well, I'll probably get there first because I'm so much older. Right. How about questions from all of you? What would you like to ask Bob? Yeah. Why did you pick a female homicide detective? Because you're obviously you're a dude. You're not female. How yeah. Relate? Well, thank you for noticing that I'm a guy. Yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> um, so there was a couple things. Um, 
Tracy Crosswhite first appeared in the David Sloan novel Murder One. She appeared with Kensington Row. And so when um, when I was let go and they were told me they didn't want to publish any more of the David Sloan books, um, I my agent Meg, who's very empathetic, said, move on. <laughs> and I was like, okay. And she said, think about if there might be any spinoffs. And so when I originally went back and I looked at Murder One, I thought Kensington Row. Not only because I love this name, but, you know, there was a lot of background and I thought this is somebody. But then um, as I kicked it around with um, a little bit with Meg, you know, I, I didn't I didn't want to write I didn't want to write the the male police officer who lives in a trailer at the beach. You know, he's an alcoholic. He can barely survive. But somehow he manages to solve every case that's ever put in front of him. And um I started to I started to get in touch with friends of mine who worked in the criminal justice department at at the prosecuting attorney's office and stuff, and I started they started putting me in touch with police officers to help me, and I came to realize there was one female homicide detective. And, and this was 2012, probably 2011, 2012. One, and I thought, so I went and met her. Her name was Dana Duffy, and. You know, I remember talking with her and and um, all the different things that she had to deal with, you know, was was really pretty amazing. Um, and so so I started to kind of to look into that. And and that's really why I did it. I wanted to do something different. And, you know, I often get asked, you know, how do you write from the perspective of a woman? And the answer is I don't. And, and I will never make that mistake. Um I, I just don't think there's a tremendous difference between us when it comes to what we're trying to do in our jobs. And Tracy's a perfect example. Her job is to solve crimes. Well, that's the men's job too. How she does it, you know, she doesn't sit there and do her nails when she's at her desk. I mean, you know, the, all that stuff is just sort of, um, and I have four, four, four sisters, three of whom are older, <laughs> and they raised me. So yeah. when you wrote her game, I mean, that's a, a woman-led series, I mean, led story as well. Yeah. Very good. Yeah, so thank you. You're back in the big one. You were, we were here discussing it. Yeah. One with it last year. Yeah. Right. And it's sort of the same thing is, you know, I didn't want to write a book about a lawyer who's, you know, an alcoholic, you know, I the verdict, you know. Um, I wanted to write about, um, I wanted to write about someone that has you know, she has to go, she goes through an experience that most men don't go through. In fact, I'd say might be, be a rare occasion. I'm sure it's happened. Um, I think they made a movie about it at one point where, but you know, she's basically sexually harassed in her prior job. Um, and she's got to move on as a result because nobody's going to do anything about it. So, um, I'm a retired, I'm a qualified detective. Ah, yeah. And uh, my stupid supervisor, supervisors, <laughs> that actually a few of us and I, your, my sister's grave, we started reading that. And so now I've read nine of your books. I don't know oh, thank you. Know how many they've read now. Yeah. But I heard about it from the sergeant about homicide. Yeah. Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. Wow, I love that. Are you down here? Uh, no, no, Pacific Northwest, Oregon. Okay. Yeah. Oh, interesting. Well, you she might, might have to not give me talk a card. so candidly about it <laughs> or here, right? Right. Well, I mean, you know, I think the thing that that is the most frustrating thing for me, but also, um, you know, when we were having all the riots in Seattle, mm -hmm. it was really hard to watch these guys breaking into stores and stealing stuff and, you know, walking out with clothes and you're thinking, you know, and I remember talking to friends of mine that are and or retired police officers and they told me when it was happening, they said, Bob, there are police officers in the crowd with cameras like everybody else and they're videoing everybody that's doing everything and they will get every single one of them. And do you know that they arrested over 250 people and they charged them for the... 
Listen, yeah. we had that happen here. Do you remember when they broke into the mall and then went across the street and trashed the Mercedes dealer? And um, social media got all... I the thing I find so amazing. You worry about, you know, phones all the time in your stories. There doesn't seem to be a criminal who's smart enough to remember not to take a cell phone yeah. out on the job, so to speak, or not... Yeah. I mean, that's how they got most of the January 6th people. Yeah. You know? I mean, yeah. it's, it's this weird... Yeah. I don't know... Do we all feel like there's some weird bubble that, you know, sits on us when we're on our phones? So that all our conversations while you're standing in line at the drugstore talking to somebody, nobody else is actually listening to it? Well, I think they, I or, think, they think that everybody's part of their, the group, right? So nobody's going to turn them in. But like you said, I, he's, I remember my buddy Alan telling me, he goes, there's police officers in that group, I, I'm playing yeah. clothes, and they're walking around, and they got their phone going. I know. It's amazing. The, the only solution is, as I said, leave it at home. Actually, there there are some instances of people trying Which to do... Which is the next Kira book. Oh, good. Um, are trying to establish... Or alibi can now sort of be established by where your phone was. Yeah. But the problem is, you know, that you could leave your phone, you yeah. could leave it on speakerphone and have... and. And you don't have to be there, so you can kind of trick it. Cure to beyond reasonable doubt. It's be coming right. out next year. Aha! Uh -huh. <laughs> a preview. Here we go. I want you to write a sequel to um, her Deadly Game. Are you thinking about that? That's such a yeah, great. That's, yeah. That, that, so that's beyond. Oh, reasonable that is. Doubt. Was that her name? Yeah. Cure I've forgotten did. the name. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. No. Um, that book's done really well, and I came up with a great idea. Um, Oh, good. Because I think that psychological you, you had a brilliant idea. Yeah. If you haven't read her Deadly Game, it's one of Bob's very best plots. I mean, it is really a super book. I think I was. Um, it's a lot of. It was a lot of fun. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Yeah. All right. Another question. Now that we. Yes, ma'am. So am I. <laughs> I did not know that you had a second one. Is it a standalone or? They're 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 both standalone at present. So the first one is about a um, reporter. He's 19 years old. It's 1933, in the middle of the Depression. He's from Kansas City. Don't ask me why, because literally I was going to write a story from the perspective of a young defense attorney who gets called by the police, because back in the day, the reporters were embedded with the police. So the police could call him up and say, hey, we got a murder. Do you want this story? And somebody from the Seattle Times would be the first one there, and they'd get the whole story, right? And they'd scoop everybody else. So I was going to write it from the perspective of a de defense attorney and literally woke up early morning, and this kid was talking to me. And he's like, I want to tell this story. I want to tell this story. And so I've learned to trust it and just go with it. And the story is, you know, he's from Kansas City, and he graduates, and his father says, you know, it's the depression. I, I can't send you to college. I, I don't have any money for you. And your aunt's coming to live with us because her husband took his own life, which was a huge problem back during the depression. So have you thought of the military? And he's got a mother that says, oh, hell no. And she starts making phone calls to relatives and he gets a job as a reporter at the Seattle Daily Star. And he's supposed to be just sort of a, a you know, a gopher. And he gets there and the, the, the guy who runs the paper, Howard Fishbaum, everybody calls fish he has he's had a reporter that that's quit so you know can you you want to be a reporter yeah here's your so anyway this kid gets a phone call he's he's been on the job for about a year and he gets a phone call from a very famous detective named ernie blunt and he was a homicide detective in seattle and he says we got a killing at the pom-pom nightclub on profanity hill <laughs> true story this is all documented in dozens and dozens of newspaper clippings because my wife's grandfather was the attorney representing the killer who was a gangster. So you have, you have the depression, you have bootlegging, and you have the Seattle Police Department, which was completely and totally corrupt up until about the 1960s, but especially so in the 1930s. So this kid doesn't know who he can trust. And he's, he's trying, he's following this trial about this, this gangster that gets put on trial for the killing of a light heavyweight boxer in his pom-pom nightclub. And there's people that witness it, but nobody's talking and everything. So that's the first book. And that was, that was a, just so much fun to write because Seattle back in the 1930s was, was really a fascinating place. I mean, you talk about the, the wild west and the, the, you know, the, 
the prostitution houses and the gambling houses on one side. On the other side, you had these ultra conservative religious people, you know, who wanted to shut down no gambling, no anything inside Seattle. It was just really just, and you're on the waterfront. You got sailors coming in on ships because we're getting ready for just, it was fascinating time period. The second story is the story of um, 1947. And it's based on, again, on true events. Um, and it's about a guy who during the depression, right, can't go to college, so he joins the, the National Guard, which a lot of people did at that time because they were told, you're not gonna get sent overseas, it's the National Guard, you're gonna protect the homeland. Well then, FDR federalized the National Guard and these guys got sent overseas. He got sent to Manila. And you know what happened in Manila, right? The Japanese overran Manila and you had the Bataan Death March and you had thousands and thousands of prisoners in prisoner of war camps and the conditions were absolutely horrific but where it gets really bad is when the japanese defense minister sends out a proclamation saying we cannot allow these prisoners to live because they're witnesses to all the atrocities we've committed so they packed them on these what were called hell ships and they took them out and they were they were almost like um, human shields, but they didn't mark the boats at all because they weren't planning on using them as human shields. They were just planning on letting them die and then throwing them overboard. Um, so it's, it's an absolutely fascinating story. Um, two guys did more research than you could ever imagine. And um, they asked me to come in and, and help them to write the book. And that's, that's the one I'll be out. That'll be out next um, January of 2025. Um, a Killing on the Hill, the 1933 book, will be out next April. And I'm going to be here. I'll we be have to here. coordinate my travel schedule. Yeah, well, right, I'm, I know, or yours, I've because all, you're always somewhere. Yeah, and I'm, I'm going to, um, I've been asked to, to do... Um, to do guest of honor at Left Coast Crime in yeah. Seattle. On, so that'll be the 10th to the 14th of April, you will be right. at the crime conference, right? Yeah, and then there's there's two book clubs down here that have asked me, you know, would you be willing? And I said, well, that's right about the right time. <laughs> I said to, called up Gracie and said, I think I should go down to the Poison Pen in April. Gracie likes to come too, because she's a, she's a big foodie. <laughs> and Scottsdale has become a real food capital. Yeah. So Gracie likes to come down. Gracie's great. We've had some good times. Fun. Anybody else? Um, hold strong, hold strong, which is sort of a little bit of a play on words. Um, it's one is, you know, stay alive. But the uh, second is they were put in the holds of ships that were metal. They couldn't get out. Yeah. Yeah. The world played chess. multi-generational piece where the dad and the son and then the older person who's in there, they all feel like coming of age in each three of those at such different times right. in the world and through life. Right. And then the telling of the Vietnam story. Yeah. Did they come to you at the same time or no. did some stories you put in the family? Wait, so how did that come about? So the, the, the story that came to me initially was my summer of senior year when I got a job on a construction crew with two Vietnam vets. And, you know, I never at the time going through it thought, well, this is going to be a book someday. But when, as I was sitting there thinking, I'd like to write another literary type of novel, you know, I started thinking back on that time in my life. And that was really a, a point in my life where, you know, I really, I really, I grew up in a bubble. I mean, I grew up in Burlingame, California, and it was a total bubble. Um, and I had a loving family that was a total bubble. And then suddenly here I am with these two guys that are telling me, you know, they were, they were hunting prostitutes in Vietnam when they were 19. They don't believe in God. I mean, there was just, everything was just bursting, you know, all these. And um, so that's kind of what I thought I was going to write. And I was going to supplement it with my son's senior year in high school playing football. Um, but I was going to set it in San Mateo. So what happened was I wrote that story. And I gave the book to my son to read because I didn't want him to feel like I was usurping his life um and i wanted to, he was comfortable with it so he read it 
and he's a very intuitive young man. He's incredibly intuitive. And he came down and he said to me, um, I came over and he said, you know, I loved it. I really liked it. But dad, I don't have any idea what happened in Vietnam. It's not taught in schools. Nobody ever talks about it. Um, it's sort of like the forgotten war. He said, I don't know what happened. And I went, huh? So I went into my, what used to be my daughter's old bedroom where I have all my sort of my writing books that I've had collected over the years. And on the shelf was a book called Nam. And I had bought that in 1981. And I bought it because of the two guys I had worked with. And it's, it's this, these snippets of all these things that happened to these men who fought in the bush. And it's just dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens of stories. So I started reading that and then I started supplementing it. And I went and I started uh, checking out all the books I could, but I, I kind of avoided um, the really famous books like Carl Mar Marante's book, um, The Matterhorn. And then what's the Vietnam book that won the Pulitzer Prize? I can't remember the name of it. On Honor something? I don't recall. Um, I remember trying. It's a very hard subject for me because yeah. I'm a Vietnam War widow. Yeah. So, you know, it doesn't go over well with me. I did not know that. You didn't? I did not know that. Yeah. So it's a, yeah, it's a, it's a, it was a horrible, horrible time. And um, my biggest concern was I wanted to get it right for the men who fought there. Um, I did not, I did not want anyone to think I was trying to take advantage of the situation. I wanted to get it right. And probably the, the best email I ever got was from the Vietnam Veterans Association when they emailed me to say, it's probably the best, the best book we've ever read on what really happened over there. Um, and what was interesting was the book came out right when Biden was pulling all the soldiers out of Afghanis Afghanistan. So I started getting phone calls from newspaper reporters and television reporters saying, is this, is this a book, a reflection of what's happening in Afghanistan? And how do you answer that? Probably best not to. I didn't. <laughs> no. Right. I said, I don't know. That's for you to decide. I didn't, I, I, I'm not a political person. I just tried to write a story that people would read. Yeah. Well, what was really, what's really fascinating is the way we did the Audible book. Because they gave me three tapes of three different people doing the reading of, of William's story in Vietnam. And they were all good, but the guy that I chose was, he sounded like Richard Dreyfus to me. He just sounded just brilliant. He had the accent down, the New Jersey accent, everything. And I said, this guy, and they all smiled. And I said, oh, did I pick the right guy? And they said, he's a first generation Vietnamese actor. Yeah. Yeah. So it was, it was really, really interesting the way that that happened. Um, and you know, that's probably the, that's, well, I can't say it's the only time, but, um, when I wrote, a, you'll know, you, you don't know what I'm talking about, but I, when I wrote about the one particular death, I cried when I wrote that because I really did not want to kill that individual. I just didn't. Um, and it was really hard. Yeah. Well, on that note, I think that we should probably thank Bob for coming was one more and sharing. Somebody, oh, I'm sorry. Was question? there one? I beg your pardon. I didn't see your hand. Comment. Okay. I love that book so much that as soon as I finished it, I read it again. Mm. And then in our book club last month, we, um, and most of us are of the Vietnam era, but we had some younger gals in there, and we had the best discussion of any book in seven years that we ever read. Wow. Everybody came from that meeting one, wanting to read more. It just touched everybody, and we all said, we knew there was a war, but we really didn't know that much about it. We yeah. really didn't. So, um, quite a phenomenal book. Thank you. Yeah, and I get asked all the time, what's the, what do you think is the best book you ever wrote? And the most meaningful book for me was Sam, 
but the I think the best book I've ever written is the World Played Chess. I really do. Given the subject, many more to write, so it's too soon to make that an actual proclamation, right? Right. True. All right. So now we'll thank Bob for thank you very much for your comment. Thank you. Thank you all. I, um, I, Did you wake up, Kyrie? Have you all noticed that we have a little canine fan here? She's so sweet. She has the best hairdo. I love it. I know it. It's just great. Anyway, if you 